But other than that, I think we're we're good to move on. So for the next hour, forty-five minutes, something like that. Probably not not as long as the last one. Anyway. Um, we're going to talk about mixing models, uh, what they are, why we use them, why they're good, why they're bad, why, 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 why. Um, essentially, so what we've talked covered this morning up to now has gotten everybody here to the stage that they have received a data file from me, analyzed based on that, with isotope ratios for carbon, nitrogen, maybe sulfur, maybe hydrogen, that are based on well-collected samples that are with sufficient diversity to address their question, that have been properly preserved, have been properly taken care of. Yeah, so samples have been properly preserved, properly prepared, every, every, everything was perfect. And you've got, you've got your results back. <laughs> yeah. It exists, it exists. Um, so those results are essentially just a number that gives you the amount, relative amount of a specific isotope in this organism. And that's nice to know, it's interesting, but you can't really do much with it. It's, doesn't, it's not ecologically meaningful. And that's where mixing models come in. And the idea with the, the benefit of mixing models, essentially what we're doing is relating the isotope ratios to an ecologically meaningful data. So it can give information on the, the diet or migration history of an organism. Like we talked earlier with the isoscape stuff, where once you have this good base set of baseline values in place, then with the isotope values of your, your consumer or your organism of interest, you can make ecologically meaningful inferences. The need to, to relate consumers and prey back to the or to their environment. Essentially, yeah, make biologically meaningful predictions based on stabilized data. And because they're, this is a very useful thing to be able to do this, they're very, very widely used. So this is a taken from one of the one of the papers that sent around. And this is Don Phillips. Don Phillips is the the Don of isotope mixing models. He was the first guy to. Uh, he, he made basically made one of, one of the first ones in the Isosource. It was what I grew up using. And all, the, all the kill kits you see back in the day. Um, but it's it's moved on a lot since then with a lot of others. Andrew Parnell, by Simmons, people like that we're going to talk about over the next couple of hours. Um, and essentially, if you look, this is from their review, recent review paper last year. There's a number of citations. Yeah. Um, number of citations per year between 1994 and 2012 for the term stable isotope mixing model or stable isotopes mixing models in web of knowledge. Um, well, up to, up, to, up to six months ago, we could have replicated that here, but I guess we can't anymore. Um, so, and you can see this massive growth in the number of papers using these mixing models in the last, particularly in the last five to ten years. So, this is a a really useful tool and something that's been taken up and used very, very, very widely. But still not perfect, and there's uh, quite a big deal of debate at the moment about how effective these mixing models are and about people making bold assumptions based on their on their data 
and Brian Fry of, of, of earlier fame has weighed in on this quite quite a bit. There's a, a really good article a couple of years ago. And then there's this sort of stimulated some further debate with uh, some of the proponents of these new mixing models have gotten back in and it's sort of bounced around back and forth with people saying that mixing models are, are good or bad or indifferent. And essentially what it, what it boils down to, and we're going to look at some of the reasons for this later on, is you need to know your system and your question. The mixing models work. They're a good tool to relate isotope ratios of prey to consumers. But if they're done incorrectly, or if your prey or if your data are crap, if your baselines are crap, your model is going to be crap, your results are going to be crap. And if you produce papers based on those results, Brian Fry is going to get pissed off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and one of your main goals in stabilizer of ecology is not to piss off Brian Fry. Because you, you owe them a lot. So, yeah, I would say, bush it in, bush it out. It works, but you have to know what you're doing and you have to know why you're doing it. And that's why you're here. And that's what we're going to cover a little bit over the next hour or so. That's not going to work, is it? Over the next hour or so. And then this afternoon, we'll do some practical work with, with Mixire, which is the the latest installment in a long series of stabilized dot mixing model. And this one is a lot of different people have sort of come together to build this package and it's constantly being developed. And it's uh, it's really where where to where where it's gonna be for the next five years or so at least I'd say. So the next this little discussion before before we get to that, we're gonna talk about Two source mixing models, the simplest system, the simplest mixing models, how they work. Why they don't work, the issues with them when you bring in too many different sources. This shift from mass balance mixing models to Bayesian models and different problems and how to, how to handle them. The um, trophic enrichment factors again. Grouping sources, if you've got sources that overlap, can you group them, can you, can you not group them? What's the benefits, what's the drawbacks? And then informative priors, which is something that the newer models are, are bringing in. And it's a really, a, re a really useful addition. So we start, start at the start. And this is Snowy Goat. We're going to learn a lot about snowy goat. <laughs> so snowy goat is a goat, and he likes to eat plants. So he's got two different types of plants he can eat. He can eat leaf plants, so C3 photosynthesis, around about carbon delta 13 C values, around about minus 30. Or he can eat corn, and that's delta 13 C values of around about minus 18. We know fractionation value for snowy goat's carbon is pretty small. So his isotope ratios, carbon isotope ratios, are going to closely resemble the what, what, what he eats. Snowy goat is what he eats. So if he eats corn, whoops, his carbon, his carbon isotope ratio will be around about minus 18, equivalent to corn. If he eats leaves, it will be around about minus 30. And if he's a spicy kind of goat and he likes to eat a little bit of corn, a little bit of leaves, it'll be somewhere in between, around about minus 25. So what we need, so we know basically when we, we sort of did a couple of plots last in the, the previous lecture and show this isotope food web with, with carbon and nitrogen. And you could see where consumers were sitting on either with one type of prey or another type of prey, one trophic level and another trophic level. Now that's a nice way for me to demonstrate it and for you to visualize it. But if you want to make a robust assessment on the diet of goats such as snowy, or at least the resource use, you need to be able to put some numbers to it. So the simplest way of doing this is a two-source mixing model, and this came from David Post's paper that we talked about earlier. It was 
couple of different models, of different variants on the same thing. And it's, it's a toss up which one you want to use. But for now, alpha, which is resource use of source one for, del for delta 13C, is delta 13C of your consumer minus delta 13C values of source two divided by delta 13C values of source one minus delta 13C values of source two. So you can plug your numbers into that and you'll get a resource use of source one for snowy goat. So let's try it. So snow, rather than alpha, we now have snowy. So snowy goat, so delta 13C of snowy minus delta 13C of leaves divided by delta 13C of corn minus delta 13C of leaves. So minus 18, which is snowy here, minus 30, divided by minus 18, minus, minus 30, 1. Okay, so from, by just putting values in, we can say that snowy goat gets all his energy from corn. Okay, snowy goat who doesn't live in America, so he's not eating corn, has, you plug his different values in, so minus 30, minus 30, from minus 30, minus 18 from minus 30, he's not eating any corn. Okay. So now we go here in the middle around about minus 24, plug the values in, he's getting 50% of his diet from leaves and 50% of his diet from corn. So this is a, a simple way to get a, a general look at the diet of, of consumers. It works well when you've got a, a simple system like this, where you've got well-defined prey groups and a, a simple, simple consumer. Yeah. But it has quite a poor resolution. Yeah. If, it is, if your, your prey groups aren't very well-defined, you can't really, it becomes difficult to discriminate between them. You've no error term in it. You just get a single value. And you can do it for lots, for lots and lots of different goats, and then get the, the mean and standard deviation for a herd of goats. But initially, you don't have you don't have this error term, and it doesn't account for trophic enrichment. Now you can do that. You can say you can build it into your model. So your source, if you want to say, rather than just using the raw source value of minus thirty or minus eighteen, you can say minus thirty plus one minus 18 plus 1 to account for that predicted fractionation step. But unless you want to start running lots and lots and lots of models, you can't account for that variation in enrichment factors. So you can say pick a, a mean value and say it's good enrichment by, by 1, but you can't bring or build in that, that error term in your, in your enrichment. But the, the real kicker for a two-source mixing model comes when you try to solve between more than sorry, more than two sources, more than three sources in this case. So if we have a third source, so Snowy Goat here has moved and he's now living down near a down, down near the coast. So he can either eat some leaves, he can go and eat from the cornfields, or he can go down to the seashore and eat some see some seaweed. And the seaweed has delta 13c values of minus 24. So Snowy, if he has delta 13c values of minus 24, he could be eating 50% leaves and 50% corn, like, like we saw in our mixing model, or he could be eating 100% um, seaweed. And there's no way of, using this simple two-source mixing model, there's no way of saying which of these scenarios is the case. So what do you do? Well, as somebody who is employed, employed by an isotope lab which requires people to send lots of samples, I think you need to use more isotopes. And in doing that, you can add nitrogen here as, a, as an x-axis and say what trophic level is snowy feeding at. So if you're at different plants or maybe at different nitrogen values, then you can work it in that way. Or you can use an additional marker like sulfur, and say which will pull apart this marine or saline 
producers in this seaweed from the uh, true terrestrials value set. And essentially your mass balance equations, which is a, a build upon this two source mixing model, will work if your number of sources, you, you, you can resolve them when your number of sources is less than or equal to the number of isotopes plus one. If you have lots and lots of different sources, you need lots and lots of different isotopes and you need them all to give you different bits of information. So it quite quickly starts to break down. It's a nice, simple, intuitive system, but it doesn't have great resolution and it doesn't really deal with real world scenarios. So this is where this is, this is where people started to bring in maximum likelihood models such as isosource or Bayesian models, to, such as is Mixer, Sire or Mixer. If they have a system where you have more sources than the number of isotopes plus one. But the golden rule of mixing models is bullshit in, bullshit out. How, so if you're data don't make sense and you're trying to force poor data onto a mixing model, then you can you'll get a result, but it'll be a nonsensical result. So how do we avoid this, this, this bullshit term? So we're going to go through a couple of different, just a, a little mix, mixing model scenario um, for the next few minutes, uh, where we're going to look at a, a hypothetical ecosystem with different sources, different consumers, and what you can do to, to, to minimize the, the error or bullshit in your mixing models. So this is our, our hypothetical system. And we have, based on two isotopes, isotope one, which is in the default carbon position, isotope two, which is in the default nitrogen position. So we start, we've got all your isotope data back, back, from, back from me, back from SYNLAB, and you start to plot out your, your, your data. So you start with some of your baseline data, and this is, this is fantastic. You follow my advice, and you've taken lots of different individuals for, your, for each for each prey source. You know, so your prey source, so you've got a nice little spread of source one, nice little spread of values for source two, a nice spread of values for source three, and a nice spread of values for source four. Okay, so you've got, and this could be benthic algae, or um, phytoplankton, or it could be mollusks and zooplankton and Cacoptrums, or yeah, it could be anything. These are different potential sources in your in your hypothetical system. And then you've gone and okay, you've done two steps in one there for some reason. But you've done and added your your consumers in. Yeah. So let's say the first thing we did is changed your prey sources to means and standard deviations because it's a little bit easier to deal with and a little bit easier to, to visualize. And then you've got three different consumers that you're interested in, in what they're doing. So these could be two, two different fish, oh, excuse me, three different types of fish. And again, you've got a nice spread of data points for, for each of those fish, for each of those species. So how do you resolve this into, into a mixing model? So the first, like, obviously you can't, if you try to do a, your, your single variable for, for carbon, it's all going to break down, your sources are too close together, everything overlaps, is not what you can do. So what you want to do is relate the consumer to each of these prey, potential prey sources. Yeah? So when we look at consu consumer one, say so these white dots, which prey source is this closest to? Of the, of the dots. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. It's, so it's, it's in, in delta space. Think of, think of, so what you've done here is you've produced, re, re, recreated your, your food web on a, 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 in geometric space, in two-dimensional two space, using marker one and marker two. And you've got consumers and prey, and you want to say which one is more closely related to each other. Oops. 
saying a a is closest to b, or it's closer to there, or that one is using more of that than it's using of that. For the, for, the, for the benefit of the, of the webinar people, I'm, I'm saying that is using more of that than it's using of that. But we have to account for, it seems, seems everybody's seen the slides, it's not just make much fun anymore, we have to account for fractionation. It's not as simple as just plotting up your raw data and saying, yeah, okay, these, these are close, closer together in the raw values. We need to account for this fractionation step within the within the, the predator prey within the consumer reactions or interactions. So the trouble with enrichment factors is that they vary, as I said earlier, between consumers, between different tissues, according to different prey types. And in both carbon and nitrogen, we've got this large degree of variability, but we do have general sort of mean values we know we know for both. So how do we incorporate that explicitly into our models? Well, it's a source of this variability. We can either take it just on the mean or we can take these maximum and minimum error values. And while most people just take the mean, there's a strong argument and a strong case that you have to consider the maximum and minimum values. This is one of Tony's papers. Um, I didn't just include this because I know he's going to ask me about it anyway. Um, what he's looked at is a species of bird called terns. And this is a plot in carbon and nitrogen of the common terns here and here and potential prey sources. And what Alex Bond, one of Tony's student, students at the time, yeah, did, was, so this plot has been corrected for fractionation values. So unlike here, where it's just the raw values, they've corrected the, the consumers for fractionation. So here, li literally, how close the consumer is to the prey is a representation of how similar its diet is or how, how similar it is in terms of resource use, how, how likely it is to, to use that resource. But we've got two different values for, for common terms. And these values are for the, same, the exact same individuals, but fixed with different fractionation values. And they've taken from, from literature to, I'm going to say extreme values, to Maximize and minimize. Uh, the, the, like, if you take that that breadth of fractionation values, your isotope ratios could be of your consumers could be any could be either of those two two red circles. And this is a a major source of of bother of, of issue because let's see what I've got in here. If you want to look at their actual resource use, you're going to get very very different values if you say your consumer is here. Or you say your consumer is there. So how do we how do we tackle this? How do we? We don't want to annoy Brian Fry. We don't want to annoy Tony either. You know. So how do, how do we fix fix this for our mixing models? And that's, this is a problem with, with trophic and ritual factors. I'm scratching my arm. I just realised I've got the little tail. Um, there one along with the uh, the fact that any preservation methods will affect your isotope ratios, they're one of stabilized the ecologies, ecologies dirty little secret. They vary, they vary a lot between different organisms, between different trophic levels, and really we don't know why. There's a lot of different suggestions, there's a different different hypotheses, people say it's related to growth, people say it's related to size, people say it's related to diet, it's related to uh, gut flora, it's related to lots and lots of different different things, but there's no hard and fast known reason for this as yet. And there's been variation between field settings and experimental settings, which have really limited the ability to, to put in these well-defined fractionation values. So for the moment, until one of you go out and figure out how this works and write a brilliant paper, Run, run your samples through Synlab when, you, when you're doing that. Um, you, we, we, 
this is just an error that we, we, we have to live with. And it's a, a flaw. It's not, it's not a flaw. It's just, it's just a, it's a fact of life. And, but a lot of work in, in the mixing models, particularly in the, the newer mixing models, is revolves around quantifying this error, including this error, fixing for this error. And including the error term in the, well, one of the ways they do this is by allowing you to include an error term in your, your fractionation values as well as in the actual sources. So to go back to our, our hypothetical uh, food, food web here, so we've plotted our, our sources, and we now need to fix these, so we now need to include a fractionation value. This is a simplified demonstration, so it's a simplified fractionation value of a bump of around about one in carbon and around about three in nitrogen, or around about one in isotope one and three in isotope two. So we apply this to each of our sources. So source one, our red dot here, goes, becomes a, previously was our red dot, it's now bumped up here. And all our other sources are similarly bumped up, fixed for this, for this fractionation value. Now, if you include the error term on this fractionation value, you'll have a a broader shift. The, so the span of points here, or the span of potential values for source one here, becomes greater than it was down here. So we now have diff different different sources fixed fixed for fractionation, and this blue polygon is a lot of what we're going to talk about for the next for the next little while and what we'll deal with later on today. And this is called the mixing polygon. And this polygon is the area which is described by your sources. So if your consumers fall within this area, you can resolve their, their resource use. So we plot in some consumers. And we've got our, our first fish here. And that sits right up at the, the top of this polygon, very similar to source one and source two, fixed for fractionation. Consu this consumer, these little white dots down here are within the polygon, and they sit very close to our source here, the little blue dots. These gray dots are outside the polygon. What happened? Fantastic. You're missing a prey source. So you, you did really well. You collected lots of uh, the prey sources that you did sample. So you've got nice air virus, air values on your, your prey sources. But there's something there's something you haven't factored in. There's something missing. There's another prey source coming into the system. It could have been running drive nutrients. Maybe you looked at a river, but a lot of salmon came in here two months ago and laid a lot of eggs, and you didn't sample any eggs. So when you you've got your nice prey sources here, but you haven't included salmon eggs, which would be over here, fixed for fractionation, and this population of fish has been eating nothing but salmon eggs. So this is where knowing your system and knowing what's going on in your system become, becomes really, really important, because this population of fish cannot be resolved using the mixing model, you, using, using these data, at least. You can try and find other data. You can go out and call up your friend who happened to have some salmon eggs in his freezer from a different project and get some size salmon eggs, run those and then get your data point in and whew, you're saved. But using this data, you cannot resolve those that, that population. So in this example, you have four sources and only two isotopes. Don't you need a third one to actually? Mm -hmm. It's a earlier, uh, in general, don't you need you were saying you need, um, the number, for the number, however many number of sources you have, you need, you know. Well, with the, so the, yeah, so the question from, the question was that, do we not need, so in this hypothetical example, we've got two isotopes and four different sources. So I said earlier on that you can only resolve mixing models for where n sources equals n isotopes plus one, which is not the case here. So that primarily applies to the mass balance mixing models. Oh, nice. If you're going to use the, um, 
certainly if you're going to use the, the Bayesian models like the sire or mixed sire that we'll talk about later on, that can handle this type of data. Yeah? But again, if you were trying to do that with a mass balance model, it'll, it'll fall apart. Yeah, so you can, you can add these into your model. Yeah, when you do your, your mixed R model or whatever, or whatever model you're, you're, whatever model you're into, and you can stick, stick those values in, and it'll give you a result. It'll probably say, oh, well, they get 50% from there, and 20% from there. But it's, the model is just a, a formula. It, it'll always give you a result. It'll always give you a value. But if, the, if your consumer is outside of this mixing polygon, your value is essentially worthless. Yeah, it's just going to throw your value because you, you've asked it a question, and it doesn't know that your data is crap. But so know know your system, know your data, get your baselines, and avoid this happening as much as you can. So the other potential issue is here. We've got two sources, and they're practically identical in terms of their stable isotope ratios. Yeah, there's maybe some little bit of variability if you're, if you squint, but uh, re realistically they're, they're, there's no, no statistical difference between those two distributions of values. So how do you, how do you deal with it? How do you resolve whether this consumer is feeding on blue dots or green dots? You have two different. Uh, you have a couple of different options. You can say either say, well, it's either feeding on blue dots or green dots, so we mix them together and just, just call them bluey, greeny, turquoise dots. But what if? And that, that could be okay if you're that's one species of zooplankton and another species of zooplankton. But if your blue dots are one species of zooplankton and your green dots are a Piscivorous fish or a planktivorous fish, which potentially could have similar isotope ratios, then you're making a completely different inference about uh, the resource use of this fish. It's, you're either saying it's a, a piscivore because it's closely related to your blue dots, which is a planktivorous fish, or it's another planktivore because it's closely related to your green dots, which are a which are a zooplankton. If if they're both if they're both the same, if they're both just zooplankton, then they're ecologically similar, so you, then you can conceivably you can pool them. If you want to separate these out again, you can, like we said earlier, you can add more markers, add more isotopes, add more money for um, You So if you, you bring in some sulfur or hydrogen or something like that, that might be allow you to, to separate between these. In that hypothetical example, that's, that's not better. Um, and an alternative option, or the, the last option now, is you can add some informative priors. And I'm going to go through each of those three options now and just sort of see a little bit about how, why, and when you should use each of those. So the first question, the first thought, is to combine sources, to pool your sources. And this is a, 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 really, a really nice paper. There was, if you're looking for some of the nice background uh, stable isotope papers and a, a, a single resource to find them in. Oikologia in 2005 produced, brought out a special issue on stable isotope ecology. And there's a lot of foundational papers. It was just, it was a really nicely timed issue that the, the field had just moved to a, a nice point that a lot of fundamental work had been done and resolved a lot of questions and they got a lot of good people to put good papers into this. And there's a lot, I don't know the citation indexes for it or whatever, but I'd imagine it's quite high. So I'll go there, 2005 Oikology, and have a look at those papers. One of those papers was by Don Phillips, uh, Seth Newsom, and Julian Gregg. And Phillips and Gregg wrote Isosource, which was one of the first widely used mix, pieces of mixing model software. And Seth Newsom was, uh, I think this was after his PhD, and he'd done cool work looking at um, diet, diet, of, diet of humans from um, archaeological remains. 
So what they've got is a food web here with carbon and nitrogen on the two axes. Two different human groups or different pop data, carbon and nitrogen data from two different groups of uh, Holocene humans. Where we early Holocene, which is EHG, and mid Holocene, MHG. Then they have values for different potential prey types that they thought these consumers or these human groups might have been eating. And these are terrestrial plants, small corn, terrestrial meat, uh, pinnipeds, marine fish, and shellfish. Yeah? So they wanted to resolve, using mixing models, what the, these two different groups were eating. And you can see their two groups are nicely within the mixing polygon, so they're pretty well set. If they hadn't included pinnipeds, their mixing polygon would have gone like that, yeah, and would have omitted their omitted their humans. So they would have been in a a real bind in terms of where to go with their mixing models. So that's just a, just just a case in point. This is this is where they get uh, good guys are good guys. So start. With, the, with, the, with these three prey, prey groups. They've resolved, resolved for all the different prey groups, but in terms of the mixing or combining different groups, we're interested in these three, these pinnipeds, marine fish, and shellfish. So if we look at the resource use, and this is, from, this is results from a, a mixing, from a isosource mixing model with pinnipeds, shellfish, and fish. And this is the, the proportion of the diet is zero to one hundred percent of the diet built up of these pinnipeds, or of shellfish, or of fish, and that's so. And the other side then is frequency, the number of times the model gave this value. So how often the model said zero percent of the diet was from pinnipeds, fifty percent was from pinnipeds, or twenty-five, or twenty-six, or twenty-seven, or whatever. So for each three, each of these three groups. We can say that you've got reasonable data, but it's not very good. You're sort of saying, well, 25% of the time you've got, or a max of 25% of the time you've got pinniped diet is between zero and 50%. It's the same for shellfish. It's even worse for fish. You've got lots of uh, potentially really high proportion of the diet, but it didn't come back from the model with very strong result. So what do you what do you do to resolve this? Or what what one thing you can do to resolve this to get a, a better resolution in your model? Is they pooled these three together and said, okay, well what about marine foods? What if we're just going to say, are they getting their resources from terrestrial or from marine? So you can pool the three of these together and then you get a you're at, like one thing you're asking Asking your model a different question. You're not asking it to decipher between pinnipeds, shellfish, and fish. You're saying any of these marine foods. So any of these three are in their diet a much higher proportion of the time. And they're also have a much greater likelihood, much better strength in your model because they're getting a much greater hit that it's in these small range. So by pooling their sources, they were able to get a, a lower resolution on their, their resource use. They can't say exactly what group that these early humans were eating, but they can say that they were getting a lot of their resources from, from the marine environment. So this is one example where it can be useful to, to pool it. And this is, again, just more, more of their results. And this is from the middle Holocene group. They've estimated that 50% of the diet, give or take, was from marine. Uh, early Holocene group, 70 80% from the diet from marine. <gasps> So if you were to not pool the sources that way, or pool your resources that way, you'd have lots and lots of these low, low, low frequency values that are don't don't give you as well. They, they give you different information, but it's not a, it's not as clear cut. So sources can be first. Yep. So that has to be done after the fact, right? Because if you would have pooled all those before. Just put that mean onto your polygon. Everything would, you wouldn't have that separation. Yeah, well, I think probably what they've they didn't they didn't plot that, but I'd imagine what you'll get is bigger error bars. Yeah, 
or they may have just used all, all those values. Yeah, so you just use use that as your full full range of values. So then you can take your sort of your end and your software there. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so you can you can you can pool sources. You reduce your resolution, but and your pool sources must be ecologically plausible. Like if you want to pool marine sources, or if you want to pool pelagic sources, you pool different types of zooplankton. Um, a lot of my homework is done in in lakes, and quite often there we'll pool zooplankton to get a, a representative of the pelagic food web. We'll pool <coughs> littoral or shallow benthic invertebrates to get a just a general value for this littoral part of the food web, and pool deep water invertebrates to get a general value for this profundal food web. And that way you're you're limiting the number of sources, but you're getting ecologically meaningful results. If you try to say, okay, well, I want to include all my sources at a, at a family level, and try to do that with isotopes, you're going to, the model will give you a result, but you're going to get a very weak result. And it's, uh, it's a poor way to, to interpret your data. It's a poor way to handle your data. This is, isotopes are great at getting you this general picture. Is something generally feeding in the marine? Is something generally feeding on marine dried nutrients? Is something generally feeding on zooplankton? If you want to say what species of A or B it's feeding on, you're either going to have to be extremely lucky in your eyes hopes. You could, you could try and push the model in different ways. You could use like, labeled resource, resources, something like that. You just have a question. Yeah. Okay, so Carolyn's question is: If consumers have higher uh, delta fifteen and values, higher convict level, how can the consumer agree with the mixing polygon? Because the mixing po sorry, sorry, I don't need to repeat that. Yeah, Carolyn. from Carolyn. Yep. And uh, yeah, so the question was that. If a consumer has a higher 15N value, how can it be within the polygon? Yeah. So the polygon is fixed after fractionation. Yeah. So remember, we went back to that step where we took our this red dot was down there, and then we fixed it for fractionation and went to there. The blue dot was there. So this polygon is built, is drawn after you've accounted for fractionation in in your resource between the resources and the consumer. I hate to even think about this, but what if one of these don't? Yeah, <laughs> I, I have to. It's, it has to be asked. What if, heaven forbid, one of these really uh, humans, one of these jerks, ate another, the other group, or even heaven forbid, even ate themselves, cannibalism? Mm -hmm. so what happens in those situations where you have like these? Um, Cannibalism, or or your two, you know, well, it, it, so, each other. Yeah. So, so the question was, what happens if you have within your consumer group uh, a cannibalistic scenario, where and that's okay, it might be hopeful, or conceivably less likely in humans, but I know there's a lot of lots and lots. It's a, a factor in lots and lots of fish studies. Lots and lots of fish are cannibalistic. Um, so there, the first thing that you'll see is you've got you'll have a big difference in your consumers in the nitrogen values of your consumers. You're looking at a, an individual level variation there, yeah. So your consumer not 15n values will span more than one trophic level, and from that you can say okay, well we're going to have to either include the lower trophic level as a prey, or again it comes down to knowing your data. You have to Plot your data, think about it, what's ecologically meaningful, what makes sense, and use that to define your model. But I guess one of the things I'm trying to get across here is that you can't just get a load of data from me, plug it into a model, get a result, and write your, write your report, write, write your paper, write your thesis, write whatever. You need to stop and think about what you're doing, because there's a high risk of 
some bullshit has creeped its way in as we we're <laughs> cut, cutting out all the short all the shortcuts or taking all the shortcuts, and that bullshit is worked its way up in the front and center in your mixing model. Where were we? <laughs> um, yeah, so I think to get back to that point about the, if you've got a cannibalistic scenario, you're probably going to try and make an inference from the, the 15N values. And if you have some consumers, like so those cannibals would be outside the polygon because they'd be 15N. And they'd be up there. Yeah, no, no, they wouldn't. They'd be up there. Yeah. So what you'd have to do is say, okay, well, this group here are a potential source for these, yeah, or something else is a something is a potential source for those. But you can also with the you can use like incorporate a lot of that in your fires, right? You could, yeah, you yeah. Sorry, spider. Really cool. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll get to um we'll get to you okay? Yeah, cool. Don't no worry. Um we'll get we'll get to priors in a bit. Yeah. But again, even with the priors you still want to you still want to get stuff within that polygon. Yeah. Because you can you can force the model, you can drive the model, you can tell it to do different things, but it's only as good as the data that's gone into it. And that's the that's the bottom line. It's just it's just a formula. It's a very complicated formula, but it's still just a formula. So that's to pool sources. The other option is to add more markers. And again, we saw it with the with the whoops with the two in the two source mixing model. It still it works just as well in this more complex scenario. So going back to Snowy Goat, if we add sulfur in to a terrestrial marine system, it can allow us to resolve. So that could be our. Oops. So our green and blue up there, our green and blue up there. If we go here, this is our green and blue here. So they're similar. Okay, they're not similar in that picture, but uh, imagine that they were. And then you split them that way using a, using an additional marker using sulfur. So, and that's where you can bring in these additional markers to look in a, in a specific scenario. So then the, the coastal, in the coastal, like in this example, you can look at sulfur. In a river, you might want to use hydrogen, you use deuterium. Or in a, a marine environment, you can maybe bring in some, bring in oxygen to look at the depth profiles, things like that. Hmm. So to get to Zach's point, which is a chaos's point, sorry, um, you'll need the benefits of Bayesian. And this is uh, the third option to deal with these overlapping sources. And this is prior, this, uh, the third option is informative priors. So any Bayesian model, now this is a, a very simplified version of a Bayesian model that comes from the Mixer, um, well it actually comes from a presentation that Brian Stock gave last year. Um, we're going to build a lot on the work he did in Mixer this afternoon, so kudos to him. And this is one thing where he put up, so you've got in your, your Bayesian model, any UMB folks, Guillaume Dauphin is a postdoc in our group, and he's going to do a, a workshop on Bayesian models next week, so go to that, because I don't really know about it. <laughs> um, but essentially you've got posterior draws based on and prior, your prior estimations by likelihood. Your posterior draws are your prior estimations by likelihood. And this pri these priors are an integral part of mixing models. And it's basically what you're doing is you're saying you're uh, informing the mixing model with some prior information as to how likely a different outcome may be. And that can come from in terms of our trophic interactions or uh, trophic relationship stuff, mixing model, trophic mixing model. 
that could be like stomach content or observation. So if you'd done uh, a study the, the, the year before or while well, you were collecting those samples and you noticed that your, your little black circle consumers were full, their stomachs were full of green dots and they didn't see any blue dots, then you can add that into your, your mixing model to say that as some prior information out of these sources, there was a lot of green dots and very few blue dots in your in your model. And that's one way to distinguish between these two different sources. We'll look at an example of that later on today. In Mixire, it could be done in Sire as well, if anybody's inclined, but it's it's more effective and it's easier to do. It's simpler to do in Mixire. Mixire is designed around it. So this is again taken from some of Brian, Brian Stock's work and this is an, one of the outputs for our informative priors in, in Mixire. And what we've got on the, the left column is our prior. So as I said, when you when you build your model, you automatically enter a prior in. You don't you might even if you say you you're okay, you're given the option to enter a prior. If you don't take up that option, it goes to the default. And the default is that each prey source, so this is the likelihood or this is the priors for three different prey sources, and it gives each prey source an equal weighting. So this is your uninformative general prior, the, the default setting, and this is the prior that you've set in your model. If you don't, uh, if you set, if you <coughs> set a prior of one one one, or one over n number of sources, so it's taken as a, a non-informative prior, but it's. It's not really non-informative because it's giving information. What it's saying is more correctly referred to as a generalist prior because it's saying that there's no reason to think that any one source is more likely to be consumed than any other. If you have knowledge of your system, if you have knowledge of your system which tells you that that's not the case, you can add that to your mixing model. And that's essentially, that's essentially what you're doing. Could you just explain what the license were on those diagrams? Yes, they are. I'm pretty sure it's the. It's a likelihood of it being zero or one by. I'll get back to you on that this afternoon. Yeah? So this is one example of using that. This comes from the, <coughs> the Mix, Mixire guidebook, again, this Mixire manual that was circulated with the Mixire stuff. So what they wanted to do here is they're looking at the, the resource use of killer whales, and they've got a number of different potential prey sources and here are their killer whales. So their potential prey sources are different types of salmon. They have Chinook and Coho salmon, Chum and Steelhead salmon, and Sockeye salmon. And they wanted to distinguish whether these killer whales oops, were feeding on Chinook versus Coho or Steelhead versus Chum. And they can see, if you, if you just look at this raw plot of data, that the mixing model isn't well set up to resolve that question because the, where you've got your consumers, your source, the two sources are almost in a straight line with, with the consumers. So it's, it's going to be very difficult for the mixing model to accurately decipher between that, between coho and chinook salmon. You could call them salmon beginning with C and just and, and pull them like that, but that's not a very ecologically informative group, so maybe don't do that. So you can run a normal model with each of those groups and you'll get an output. But it won't be a very good output because it's not very good data. So what you want to do is to try and change, change try and stretch your model, try and factor your model, ma manipulate your model to better represent the 
totality of your, your knowledge of this system. So what they have is the year before, or when they were out collecting these fish, they looked, or collecting these killer whales, they did some scat analysis on their, their killer whales, and out of the scats, out of 13 scats, say, 10 had Chinook salmon, one had shun salmon, there was no coho, no sockeye salmon, and three steelhead salmon. So rather than, you can put that directly as it is into your model as a prior, but it's a very, for, for reasons we don't need to get into now, uh, the larger those numbers are, the more power you give to your prior. So if you say it's 10, or you put in a value of 10, it's, it's going to basically throw you back from your mixing model, your, your results completely leveraged by your prior, which says, so you'll get diet is 10, or 10% 10, 10 Chinook, 1% Chum, 3% Steelheads, whatever. It'll link it, it'll be overwhelmingly powered by the prior. So you can do a little transformation on it and get a, a better term or a, a more realistic term. This, because when you put in priors, you remember I said that the prior is automatically in the model. You're, it's not something that you have an option to put in or out. If you leave it out, it'll give a, a, an equal weighting to everything. So rather than having zero, you just have to have it as 0 0.001. Give it a very low weighting. And this, Is, is the same plots that I'm going to get back at exactly what the axes mean, but essentially what you're saying, so this is again an output from that from that version of, of Mixire, from that little run, and <clears throat> this is if you use the uninformative or the generalist prior, and this is, this is how each different source will be weight, weighted. And this is in, with the prior that you put in using this, using this term, derived from the, from the scat analysis. So what you've done is you've weighted, you've put a, a high weight on source one, which was the Chinook, yeah, a lower weight on the, the Coho, none on the Sockeye, and none on the Chum, and then a reasonably high weight or a reasonable weight on the Steelhead. Yeah. Um, so what you've done is you've added this characteristic to the model based on your, your, your scat analysis. So instead of saying, oh, well, all these prey sources are, could be consumed equally, you're saying, well, we did some work and we have a general idea that they'd probably eat more Chinook salmon than they do coho salmon or than they do sockeye salmon. So you add that into your mixing model and you get thrown out two results, or you get thrown out this result. So this is, you'll see a lot of these later on, this is the output that comes from Sire, or from Wixire. There's two different options, or two different results. This is the results of two different studies. On the left is the results based on non-informative prior. So if you just ran with the default settings. On the right, is the results if you used your informative prior. So over here. So like I said, the first thing you can see is that when you run it with the generalist prior at the default settings, you get a result. But it's very it's not very good at distinguishing at any great degree of strength between which type which species of salmon it was which we saw when we looked at, that, at, the, at the mixing model, because they were all kind of in, in an alignment. But if you add your, um, add your prior, you get a much stronger, a much stronger result that you can say 50%, around about 50% is coming from steelheads, and around about 50% is coming from Chinook. And if we just do a little run back, you can see here, so when you, when you did your prior, you weighed Chinook higher than Coho, and you weigh steelheads higher than chum. So that's where this effect of this weighting is coming in. So Brian, if you're 
presenting your data, like if you're going to publish this, do you have to show them sort of how you're coming up with um, putting this prior knowledge in there versus just biasing your data? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you should, you mean, if you're, like when you're writing your methods, you have to, so, so the question was if you're writing up a, a paper, do you have to account for the prior, why the why you use the prior values you did? And yeah, most definitely. You'll have to, in your in your methods, you'll give a breakdown of your, your model criteria, things like that. And in that, if you've put in a prior term, you'll have to say how you came about that prior term. And it can be like that SCAD analysis. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've done stuff where we've looked at um, diet or resource use in, in fish and freshwater fish, and you have a benthic feeding fish or a, a deep water feeding fish that's feeding on a profundal and a pelagic feeding fish that's feeding on zooplankton. And for reasons we don't need to get into right now, they can both have very similar carbon and nitrogen isotope values despite having very different trophic ecologies. One's a complete benthivore, one's a complete planktivore. And we were getting results coming back that our, our benthivore fish was predominantly used in zooplankton. Now we knew that wasn't the case because we knew our system. But we'd also done good content analysis on these on these fish. Sorry, this is really interesting to me too. But so what if you have two different potential ways of, of, of working? Like on this one, you did it with the scat, and you found the Chinook. Mm -hmm. uh, but what if you had looked at something else, and you got a different, like, I don't know, I can see that there's a lot of ways. Well, you should, so, <clears throat> again, the question comes, or the question from Alan was, what happens if you have different um, metrics which you use to develop a prior, and they give you different, uh, different results, different information? Um, I guess again, well, one option is to to run both and present both, and say this is scenario one based on the fullest of our knowledge this way. This is scenario two based on the fullest of our knowledge that way, and the result or the the truth is probably somewhere in between. Um, alternatively, you could try and integrate the two different methodologies or the two different metrics that you and get a more uh, a stronger prior. Yeah. Can you add more than one prior for an organism? Can you like, ask? So, so we're looking at the same life scope, so this, you know, feeding ecology of a fish. Could you say, okay, I have this diet analysis, so you can incorporate that, but could you also add, say, some metric of morphology? morphology? Say, okay, well, this mm -hmm. fish has this type of feeding morphology, so it could potentially feed on most likely these two sources. <laughs> diet say, or some economists say it's likely this. Yeah. yeah, so that's question was that whether. Does prior, is prior, does a prior have to be related to uh, a dietary analysis? Yeah. Well, uh, can, you, can you add both of those? Or can you add both? Well, multiple, yeah, multiple, multiple priors. priors as that is a question you can ask Brian Stock. Um, the mixer, as we'll look at this, look at it this afternoon. You can only add a single prior, but you. Can potentially get into the into the model uh, because it's all it's all in R, so it's all accessible that way if you know how to do it, um, and get get into it that way and try and work 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 it around that work around it that way. Certainly, you can bring in different priors that they don't have to be related to diet. It could be related to where you've observed the organism. It could be related to a variety of different things. Yeah, I think it comes from the number of sources by the by the sample size. Oh, okay. Yeah, but that's not a, a set in stone calculation. Like like a, as a matrix or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, it's a different way of br of bringing more information in. I I before saying that you definitely can do that and that well okay you definitely can do that but before saying that that would be the the best way to do it. 
I'd suggest that, and for the, for, for the benefit of people on webinar, before saying whether you can multiply two different priors together and use the, the result of that as a prior. I would ha I'd have to check with some of the actual, the, the real, the Bayesian people behind this to see is that the, the best way to bring multiple different priors into the model. And I guess it would be zero in this picture. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a question from a webinar. Uh, just bear with me a minute. Can informative data prior be age class of fish, say zero plus versus one plus? Because create items may be different in terms of mouthfeel. Yeah. And so you would need to weight the the different prey items. So if you know which different prey items are more commonly consumed by zero plus one plus two plus, then that's where you would you would add. So they would be your different sources and you could give a different weight to those different sources. Um, but in terms of just doing it by by age, I don't know how that would work exactly because it's not a it's not directly, you, you, you can't directly relate that to, to resource use without having that intermediate step of the, that dietary analysis. Can I see priors as a potential source of bias because they are set by the scientists doing the investigation? And it's the same thing uh, for Bayesian statistics in recreating phylogenetic trees. Are there any statistical methods or approaches used to justifying priors? Like something you descriptively write up why you chose the priors that you did. Is that common in the field? Um, not in the applications to stable isotopes. This is a real, like isotopes a little bit behind the curve, behind the behind the Bayesian curve. Um, we're catching up, but this priors is really it's only really taken off in the last few couple of years. And um, so in terms mm -hmm. of uh, set way to do that with dietary analyses or something like that for stabilized tops. So, uh, yeah, I'm not aware of a standard. That's not to say there isn't. Um, just, just on that point, again, I, mean, I, I was thinking the same thing, but if you do that, you're not going to get any surprises. Your stabilized top analysis is going to agree with your dietary analysis. Yeah. And so, just from a general or philosophical point of view, um, surely it would at least be better to run it without that and with it and present those two scenarios and say, you know, the stabilized stuff would be confirming the dietary analysis because they're based on it. They're, they're, well, they're, based, they're based on a lot of things. They're like, that's one part of a model. Right. There's other parts of the model which are how how similar it is in, a, in, a, in, a, in the mixing polygon. Okay, so that generates the question, um, can you weight the prior term in general? Can we give you prior terms the lower weight or a higher? Yes, and that's where, this, that's where this transformation comes in. So that's, if, you, if you did it with this, with the, with the raw values, yeah, yeah. Um, you'll get a that you'll get a very, very secure, you'll uh, overweigh, the, overweigh the model, perhaps even, it was the best way of putting it, you'll over-constrain the model, you'll get a rep result that directly reflects the, the diet, that directly reflects the prior, yeah? You constrain it right down to the, the prior. If you have a very, very large number in your prior, if you have a much smaller number, which is where this tra which this transformation does, then you minimize the the strength of the prior in the model. Does that make sense? Of that particular factor, or of the priors overall? Because it's that what you're getting at? As yeah. far as I know, for like phylogenetic analysis, yeah. you can't your priors are your priors. Yeah. So in that in in that formula, I guess it would depend on the precise numbers, but we. The weight in the final result determined by the priors versus the actual data. Well, because you always remember, you always have a prior in there. 
Yeah, you'll always have a prior there, and your your uh, the the default prior is this generalist prior that all prior items are equal are equally are equally likely. If you know that that's not the case because one of your prey items is zooplankton, you're dealing with a benthic fish. If one of your prey items is uh, a deep water fish and you're dealing with a seabird, if you're if hmm? well, okay, yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah. Um, Okay, that was a bad example. It'll be very, it'll be waited very long. It's still there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what, what you're doing, like this is, this is in there anyway. Yeah. And you're saying that all, pre all cases are equally likely. Yeah. So that's this is the, this is the default here that all cases are equally likely. You can inform that and say, based on some other existing data or based on whatever, that case one is more likely than case two or case three or whatever. Or you can say that's not that's not the reality. Or you can say that you don't, you don't want to, to make that constraint and you want to assume that all options are equally likely. Now, one of those two scenarios is a better representation of the truth. And if the truth is what you want to achieve, then it's up to you to make that decision. Uh, shouldn't talk about truth, that's a bad word to use. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the most likely scenario, let's say that. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm running away from stuff here. So the, the basic, is it more on priors? No, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, it is a good discussion. It'd be great to have somebody who, who knows more about the, the workings of the model. I, mean, I use them, but the, the behind-the-scenes stuff is is a different kettle of fish. Whoops! Sorry about that. So basically, where we're at now is just a, a conclusion slide. Um, the, the basic rules to avoid getting bullshit in your results is know your system, know your data, take time to, to think about it, plot it up, have a look at it. Have a look at the raw data, plot, plot, plot your raw data, don't jump to standard means and standard deviations. The, the devil's in the detail and quite often the most interesting stuff is in that spread of points within your, within, within your population. Stay inside your mixing polydar, your enrichment factors of errors too. We'll look at that in a little while when we're going to start playing with the mixing models. Um, how to incorporate that error in the enrichment factors. And that's when you've, it's not like that, sorry to get to get that earlier on, that it's, it's not something you can avoid. Um, but if you have, Error, if you account for the error, the potential error in your sources, and then add to that the potential error in your fractionation values, you're covering the widest range of potential flaws, potential biases in your model. And so you're not going to get a, as clear a cut a picture, but you'll get a more accurate representation, hopefully, or you're more likely to fall within a more accurate representation. Yeah, don't try and distinguish between overlapping sources. Do something to allow yourself to do that. If you've got two sources that are overlapping, your mixing model will give you a result, but don't don't put too don't lend too much weight to it. You need to rather than thinking about these as a thinking about your, your mixing model results as set in stone, you have to interpret those and what why, what's important, what's not important, how can you decipher between these different points and whether that's by pooling different sources, whether it's by using more markers or using some priors. And then when you report your mix and model results, always don't just report the mean, report report the error. So what you've got in your mix and model is a likelihood that the values are between here. What am I doing? That your values are between 
say in this proportion of diet, between 25% and 55% is the problem, eyeballing that. That's roughly where your 95% credibility in intervals are going to lie. So that's kind of what you want to what you want to be saying, rather than picking this mean value and saying it is all 49%. You need to include this range and this this error because that's the truth. <laughs> okay, that'll do for the theory of mixing models. I'm going to take another little break and then we can sit down and do some practice. Just so we know exactly what's going to happen this afternoon, who, show of hands, who has Mixer running on their laptop? Oh, you wonderful people. Okay, fantastic. All right, we'll, uh, we'll sit down this afternoon and run through a couple of the worked examples of that, and then everybody can sit by themselves uh, or in, in a group and work, work it through themselves. Really, I'm not going to put... I'll, I'll, I'll work through a few examples, and then we can sit down in groups and go through it. The Mixire manual is where I've gone, taken all my Mixire stuff from. The examples on that are top class. Those guys deserve some serious recognition for what they've put together. So we're just going to run through some of their examples. And then I think from whenever we finish that till whenever anybody wants to go back out into the ice and try and get home, we can just work through some examples. The um, webinar folks, it's, it, it's, at this point it nearly gets up to you guys. Um, and we're going to break for maybe half an hour or so now, and then when we come back, I'm going to do a, a demonstration on Mixire. After that, people here are going to be working on their own computers. If you guys want to stay logged on, you can. You can ask questions through this, or if you want to just log off and work on your own, own pace, and you can ask me questions later on, that might work better for you guys. So, yeah, that's about it.